Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hello once again. Thanks for joining us, listeners. This is an excellent topic today. It's actually one we haven't covered before, not in the same manner. With me this morning is Hartmut Burin. Oh, I think I did it right. And we are talking about movement and mobility for people living with any form of dementia. So thank you for joining me today. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So why don't you introduce yourself, give your give the audience a little bit of background, and then we can jump right into it. <laughs> okay. Um, so I am by training a physiotherapist, a German trained physiotherapist uh, with majors in orthopedics and, and um, internal medicine, uh, graduated in 1995 from uh, the German Sports University in Cologne, and came here uh, the same year I had met Back then, my ex-wife threw an internship here in the U.S., and she'd been living in Germany for a while, and then we moved back here after I turned in my thesis. Uh, initially worked here in uh, San Jose, California, as a physical therapist. And then about a year later, in the fall of 96, I started back in form with the intention to provide um, fitness training services and rehab fitness training for either frail, frail elderly and or those managing some form of chronic illness. And over the years, um, probably because of the population and age shift, where we're seeing a lot more people getting a lot, of, a lot older, uh, we've been working with a growing number of people with uh, dementia and Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. Yeah. Which is yeah. important. So. Um, I, I was blessed to have a personal trainer who she still is 15 years older than me, but at the time when I was working her with her 15 years older than me and was very focused on maintaining muscle mass and balance. So, and I, I have kept up with that. So I'm, I feel like I'm on the right path to keeping my mobility as good as possible, uh, providing I don't have any more, I, I crashed on my bike seven years ago and broke my collarbone. So no, no more of those incidences, but yeah. why, why is it so important to maintain muscle, muscle mass and balance? Well, as, as we age, um, don't even have to go into any kind of pathologies. Um, muscle, lean muscle mass is being, is being lost. Um, as much as 40% between age 40 and age 70, um, that leaves us, uh, clearly more vulnerable to falls because the strength muscular strength is really the foundation of of any physical activity whether it's cardiovascular activity whether it's balance training whether it's power training uh strength is really kind of the foundation of all of that and uh with sarcopenia which is the age-related muscle lean muscle loss um we often become less physically active creating other health risks, developing other diseases that are associated with the sedentary lifestyle. Um, we are also losing the ability to perform typical activities of daily living. Getting off the couch or off the toilet seat becomes increasingly harder. Stepping into a shower if it's a high tub uh, becomes, a, becomes a fall risk and so on and so forth. Or as simple as lifting grocery bags in and out of the back of the car. Um, so maintaining muscle mass is, is, is quite important for various reasons. One being quality of life, being able to continue to play with the grandchildren, go golfing and do all the fun stuff, that, things that we want to do when we, uh, finally have the time to do them. And, um, but it's also a matter of reducing the risk for falls, which can lead to you know, detrimental injuries. Um, and uh, yeah, being able to perform activities of daily living, live independently for as long as we possibly can. There's jokes out there. I'm, I'm part of the, I'm the, I'm an older Gen Xer and there's a lot more videos about us as a generation and aging and 
lot of people, there's jokes about these days, if you drop something on the floor, it's either the dog is going to get it or you have to go through this mind calculations as to whether it's worth trying to get it back off the floor. And while that's a funny joke, it it really is true. And my trainer that I worked with, one of the strength exercises we did literally was like overhead press, but it was like, you're hiding mm-hmm. the, the, the holiday gifts in the closet. You're hiding. So she always yeah. had these like visualizations, these statements she made. Carrying groceries is one of them that a lot of the trainers um, that I work with now, um, I'm part of the cult of Peloton. And so I do their strength and their cardio and I mm-hmm. do all of their things. So one of the questions I have, because you said um, between age 40 and 70, we can lose up to 40% of our muscle mass. Is that just mm-hmm. a natural part of aging or just because? Mm, yeah, that is a natural part or the natural cause of aging if, you, if you decide to be, be physically inactive. That's okay. not, so when it comes to um, training of any, any kind uh, as a form of um, slowing the aging process, because so far we haven't found any way to stop it, um, <laughs> But slowing the aging process is, is really about maintaining function as we age and staying above what we're referring to in, in, the, in the health industry as the, the disability threshold. Okay, we want to stay north of the disability threshold for as long as we can. And if we're lucky, we are staying north of that, go to sleep one day and don't wake up. And that's, that's, all, that's ultimately, you know, everyone's goal in some way that they don't have to go at the end of life through you know the the detrimental acts or the detrimental facts of disability you know that's we're all trying to stay away from that and fitness training plays a big role uh other healthy lifestyle choices certainly play into it as well you know dietary rest um socialization very important part as we're getting older and so on and so forth but yeah exercise is, is probably leading the way there's probably a lot of people gro- groaning right now. And just for my listeners who, I'm not sure if I've ever said this on, on the podcast. I have talked about it before. But one of the reasons that I took up weight training, um, I lost over 100 pounds a decade ago. And I've mm. kept most of it off. Yay me. Good. That, that, that part's a miracle in itself from what I understand. But this same trainer basically said, you know, you burn more calories when you're sitting on your butt watching TV if you do strength training. I was like, fine, give me the weights. But I know there's a lot of people who are like, it's very intimidating. You know, many women feel like, oh, I'm going to get bulky, which I know you can only see a little part of me, but I am not bulky from weight training, (laughs) bulky from snacks maybe. Um, What kind of safe and effective exercises can people start including in their daily life? I know walking can be really good. Absolutely, walking is walking is a is a form of cardio, aerob, typically cardio, aerobic cardiovascular activity that we don't have to learn. Most of us, you know, bearing any disabilities or injuries and so on and so forth, know how to walk. Uh, it's something we don't have to learn. We don't feel intimidated by. Uh, clearly, walking uh, outdoors is weather depending. I'm living in California, where you can walk outside pretty much all year round, but uh, other areas in the country. Um, you know, people have making the move to treadmills in the winter time to be able to walk either at the gym or in one of their rooms that they have set up for, for such a thing. Um, with respect to strength training, um, we see most of our, our clientele, which is uh, partially ambulatory, non-ambulatory uh, clients, typically at home. So we do not get to take them into a gym and use machineries at the gym. We do use free weights. We do use elastic resistant bands. uh, uh, But it starts as simple as the calisthenics. And the one exercise that everybody can do at home is a chair sit to stand. A chair sit to stand exercise is a um, a safe form of squatting, more or less. uh, And if you place the chair against the wall so it can't tip over, Backwards, I think you are in a in a very safe place to work on lower extremity strengths and glute strengths, quadriceps, and hamstrings. Uh, other exercises uh, we have, I have people do wall push ups. You know, standing against the wall, move your feet two to three in, uh, feet distance from the wall, and do perform push ups against 
the uh, against the wall or kitchen counter or moving down to the coffee table. Why? Because upper body strength with respect to pushing, which is, you know, anterior shoulders, anterior chest, chest muscles are important to, to be strong when we do take a fall. Okay. And uh, there are two things to that. There has to be the base, the foundation, the strength foundation to catch the fall. And then, of course, there has to be reaction speed and, and quick being able to move quickly, which is kind of a trend that we've seen over the last 15 years in, uh, in training with the 60 plus population. While when I came out of college, we didn't touch it with the 10 foot pole and that's called power training or rapid movement training. So what we found over the years is as we declining about 40% in muscular strength, we also slowing down about 40% in our, in our movements. We're no longer sprinting around, typically moving more carefully and so on and so forth, and at a slower pace. Now, the product of speed and strength is, is power. And uh, in order to catch a fall, that's a, that's a powerful, you have to get quickly out, the hands out, and you have to have the strength to control the fall, to decelerate the fall. Um, so we, we do that with our clients because of the possibility of falls and being better prepared. We include exercises in our home training that uh, about simple balance, forms of balance training. And typically, uh, the, the, um, if, the, if the client isn't exercising with a caregiver, which in our case is often the case, then uh, we're making sure that we give instructions to use uh, the kitchen counters, something that is sturdy to hold on to, providing that extra balance if needed. If you, so I'm thinking about my kitchen, and I'm, I'm thinking many people may have a similar situation. So we have a kitchen island. I could put my feet up against the cabinets behind me and use the countertop for push-ups. So that would, would that provide extra balance if you were feeling a little shaky just using the kitchen counter i don't know or is that, that not a good idea a sorry stim- oh well no that's uh it's it's as long as the distance isn't too far i mean obviously if it's a, the further you move feet move away from from the position that your hands are in with the, the greater the percentage of body weight you're you're moving um i don't think it's much of a balance exercise you can certainly make it a core strength exercise because when you think about the typical classical push-up on the ground it is a plank right it's mm-hmm. it's a plank act it's a plank exercise so it promotes a lot of core stability and at the same time works you know chest and triceps but um and you can do the same as a matter of fact that's how i start planks with people that are you know quite deconditioned, we're doing a plank against the wall with the elbows against the wall, and then slowly moving the feet further and further away until we move on to the kitchen counter, coffee table, and ultimately to the floor if possible. Um, so th- those things can be done. Um, I also do, in, in response to what I said earlier, uh, power. We, so we're starting with push-ups to build the foundation, and then we're doing push-offs. We're moving back a little closer than we normally are to the wall or the kitchen counter. And instead of just doing performing a slow and controlled push-up, I have them push off into balance, into a st- stance, upright stance. Uh, that helps with balance. That helps with core stability, and it helps with rapid movement. As you know, there is a need for speed, as I like to say. And this way you can incorporate that into your strength training. Yeah, it's important if you're going to fall and catch a fall, you have to have the strength to like slow down your body weight as it's being pulled by gravity towards the ground so that you don't reach out to brace yourself and then also break like your collarbone or your shoulder or your arm or all of the above. Um, And trust me, breaking a collarbone is absolutely no fun. I've done it. Right. It's the only bone I've ever broken. I'm gonna yeah. live the rest of my life with no more bo- broken bones. <laughs> so how do you, like my mom, who'd had Alzheimer's for 20 years, did not need to exercise to maintain a relatively healthy weight, which, you know, thanks, mom. She gave that, uh, that genetics went to my sister. I got the fat gene from my dad's side of the family. So, you know, um, exercise has to be a part of my daily life or else um we'll go back to the to the excess weight that i had a decade ago 
But how would you start with somebody with, say, moderate level of um, dementia? So not not the early stages when you can kind of, can you know, make them understand, but maybe the mid stages where they're like, "Why the hell do you want me to do this stupid stuff?" Right. So um, I working with folks with dementia, um, I, I always found the most challenging part is motivation because there is commonly, even if they were motivated at some point to exercise, it seems like uh, as cognition starts to decline, so does motivation. And um, so I typically now work mostly with caregivers because a lot of them have caregivers, formal or informal, meaning hired or family members that take turns and and taking care of their their loved ones. Um, So I work with them simply because I typically see them twice a week. That's not enough. Uh, but they might, because of paying already for care, not be able to have me come more often, financial situation, and so on and so forth. So I work with caregivers and clients together so that caregivers in my absence can provide a daily dose of fitness training for this group. Uh, getting back to motivation, um, from my own experience, I had clients that i would come see they would take a look at me and then they would shake their hat and say no not today <laughs> and then we i the the worst thing you can do in that case is to push because you get a lot harder pushback than you want and it makes it a lot more difficult to overcome this initial barrier um from my experience what what helps is just sitting down i talk in some cases about gardening whatever the the client's interest might be or something that while watching on the TV while I was walking in and so on and so forth, it's in fresh memory. Get a conversation started and then typically after about five minutes, say, hey, let's move on to the chair and we're going to get get exercise. Works in, in about 60 to 70% of the cases. In some cases, it takes a little bit more. From my experience, uh, a very fantastic motivational tool is music. And so when I find a new client or meeting with a new client and finding out what age are they born in, then I typically go back in in time, the music that they, between 15 and 25, I think that's kind of the music in our lives that kind of sticks with us, you know, that we are listening to throughout our lives. And um, for a lot of my clients, that means... uh, Glenn Miller, or that means music of the 50s and 60s, you know, depending on how old the client is. That has helped greatly in many cases. And today it's easy because we have, we can have a Spotify or Amazon Music or Apple Music on the phone and play it on the phone. Uh, in one case, I had a client, she was a Northwestern graduate. And the one thing that got her out of bed every time was a Northwestern fight song that I was playing on the phone. And that would get her going. She would sing with it. She would move. And then I could get her to exercise. In five to two to five percent of the cases, that, that even fails. And then that's a day that we just don't exercise. So I'm not, I, you can't force anyone, but you can certainly try some tricks, motivational tricks to get somebody started. As to the exercises, the exercises do not change from my very much from my um, cognitive non non cognitive impaired and those that are cognitive with cognitive impairment. The exercises are the same. Um, what I have noticed is as dementia Alzheimer's advances, um, people become more of kinesthetic learners than uh, auditory learners or visual learners. So while it often is enough for the non-cognitive impaired that I demonstrate an exercise for the Alzheimer patient, especially past the initial stages of the disease, becomes more and more kinesthetic, meaning I'm moving passively the joint through the motion, basically, to, to teach the exercise, and then the person eventually catches on to the exercise and can perform the exercise. Um, it's and when it comes to exercising, the big groups of exercising, pushing, pulling, uh, change of center of gravity, meaning squatting, lunging, whatever, and some kind of exercise that keeps us moving, whether it's, you know, I, 
could be as, as simple as dance or holding onto the back of the chair and doing some some, some locomotion type of exercise. Yeah, you got your, your lunges and squatting to pick crap up off the floor. <laughs> yep, that's right. Or get off the floor when you actually did take a fall. Or just get off the floor if you've been playing with the grandkids, because you know, that's you always always the joke that, you know, it's you gotta really contemplate how to get off the floor if you're gonna if you're gonna get down on the floor. You gotta figure out how you're gonna get back up. And yeah. I have knees that feel like rusty hinges. But the strength training has made it easier to get up and down off the floor, even though there are su certain movements that I'll probably never be able to do, just because yeah. my knees my knees refuse to <laughs> to go past certain points. Yeah. So, how would you help um, caregivers maintain a practice of exercise, a daily, nearly daily, um, you know, like practice is the word that keeps coming to mind. With, as their disease progresses, you know, when they get more fearful because you know, you, the, my mom had significant visual processing issues. She, was, mm -hmm. she walked just fine up until the day she fell and broke her leg. Right. And then that was, that, was, that was the end of things. But um, she was not super, um, she was not, she was very reluctant to, participate in things unless it was her idea. And this was definitely late stage Alzheimer's. So how would you help them, what, how would you help them maintain an exercise routine as the disease progresses? There we go. My brain kicked yeah. back in. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains. I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about NeuroReserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. And there you go. Um, well, it, the exercise program obviously goes through different stages. And as the disease uh, advances, some of the exercises become impossible to teach. And it goes to the point where if they live long enough and become completely um, non-ambulatory, bedridden, and so on and so forth, then it's much more about passive exercising. Um, there are exercises that I have pe people do in bed where I just hold, give them a hand, and then have them pull themselves up on my hand. Stuff like that. You know, exercises that, again, are about pushing, pulling, and so on and so forth but no longer having the squatting uh, squatting necessarily in it. But sitting at the edge of the bed, side of the bed for core stability, for example, are good forms of exercise. Um, throughout the time, again, I come back to that, throughout the time, the biggest challenge is not that I don't see the biggest challenge to be the exercise itself, but to get people motivated to do these exercises. And... I will be honest, I mean, we're, we're teaching, we're working with caregivers, but caregivers have um, often a hard time getting, getting that done because it is a little different for somebody coming out, coming in from the outside that is not being seen every day. It seems like even when I'm dealing with the more advanced forms of Alzheimer's, that there is a different relationship there the patient has with me than it has with the caregiver, which they spend eight to 10 hours every day with. So often they have a more difficult time 
we're going over the same strategies that I've mentioned earlier with respect to motivation. But there is a limit to, on, to how long we can continue this. And eventually, like I said, at the, at the end stages of the disease, if they actually live that long, a lot of my clients never make it or haven't made it to that point where they became totally bedridden, um, then it becomes much more of a therapeutic approach, uh, maintaining mobility, joint mobility, and so on and so forth in order to prevent pain you know, in the final stages of the, of the, of the, of the disease. So that's kind of where, where this whole thing is headed when it comes to, and since you're, that is your, your focus group of dementia, Alzheimer's, I think it is important to understand that fitness training that we are starting at a young age and hopefully continue throughout life has an incredible value in preventing dementia there's obviously a genetic component to this, but that we cannot change. We need to take care of the things that we have actually influence on. So um, there is two things that happen to us when we exercise that both have a very, shall we say, protective effect on the brain as well. And that's a angiogenesis, which happens throughout your body. Angiogenesis is pr principally just the building of new capillaries, blood capillaries throughout. Uh, we help people with, uh, with um, um, arterial uh, ven venous diseases in the lower extremities that way to circumvent clogged up arteries through capillaries. They don't like it much because it's painful training, but it is successful to uh, circumvent some of the clogs. Um, the same happens in the brain as well. The brain is building out new capillaries and better circulatory situation at the brain is, is great for brain health. The other part is called neurogenesis, and that's just specifically for the brain. The brain also with exercising, because exercising is spatial awareness, is reaction, uh, has a lot of elements that require cognitive involvement, uh, will build new neural pathways and regenerate old quote unquote, falling asleep pathways. And um, so that's, that's a very big help in the prevention. Treatment, at least so far, the science doesn't give us a ton of hope there that it makes a huge difference. But personally, from case studies, and case studies are just, you know, my limited amount of people that I've seen over the years, I do feel that people that are exercising throughout the disease are slowing the progression of the disease okay and most importantly or more maybe even more importantly are able to prevent secondary diseases that would most certainly come from self-restricting not being motivated to move just sitting in front of a tv all day you know i mean let's face it unfortunately that's a lot of times when you're coming into centers that are dealing with with the with dementia and also in a population, that's what you see sometimes. You come into a big room and there's 20 people and they're all staring at the screen and they don't really understand what's going on. But, you know, and that's not, we need to continue to work with this group in order to prevent di type 2 diabetes, increased blood pressures, uh, risk for cancers, and so on and so forth. All things that we can positively influence through regular exercise. One of the things my mom's care home did somewhat regularly, I'm assuming, was they would sit they would sit in the TV room, the TV would be off, and they would basically hit a balloon back and forth, which yeah. obviously is much easier for people. Like I have very wacky vision, so I completely understand my mom's the visual processing issues she had. Like I don't have depth perception, so I don't like balls being thrown at me. Cause it's like I, I, yeah. I duck duck more than I swat at them or hit them or you know, like we have a really active pickleball group in our community. I'd love to play that. It looks like fun, but I'm not sure anybody want to play with me because I'd be terrible. But um, is that? I mean, that's at least getting the arms up and you're doing a little bit of pushing. I I, util I utilize balloons myself. Okay. But to me, for, um, more than an exercise, it's more of again a motivational tool. I I. I this is just me, my personal feeling is that 
the balloon brings back some kind of fond memories, even in a demented in the demented brain uh, of childhood, of playful times. And uh, so I bring in the balloon, and when I find during the exercises, you know, having motivated the person to finally sit down with me and and do some exercises, uh, that attention span is very short. Often they lose lose interest, they lose att- losing attention, and then it's kind of very easy for me to bring in the balloon, tap it back and forth for a minute or 30 seconds, and then we're going back to the next exercise. So in that form, I have used it. I've been doing the same as uh, at your mom's facility. I used to go into a uh, uh, local uh, Alzheimer dementia care center, ambulatory center here in, in Los Gatos, California, and we did the same often as a form of getting people motivated to start. In the beginning, it was a class. We're sitting around. I would go around, typically have an assistant go around the other way, and so on and so forth. It's more like a a starting exercise, getting people motivated and getting people movement, moving uh, rather than, you know, a real valuable exercise. But you're right. I mean, you're at least moving range of motion on the shoulders. with the balloon, it's a little easier than balls. Some people have tried balls, but like you said, balls come al- come at you a lot quicker. Yep. Balloons typically are a little slower. It means the reaction speed doesn't have to be the same to tap a balloon back than throwing a ball back. But we use balls. The, the people that weren't as advanced, we still use balls with more advanced folks. We use balloons. It's interesting you said it brings back happy memories. So when I was um, basically middle school through the birth of my daughter, mm-hmm. so from the age like 13 to 25, we had a, a poodle who absolutely loved to chase the balloons with, if you'd you know, snap them so that they'd fly through the air. And mm-hmm. when you talked about happy memories, that popped into my head. So yeah. I, I'm thinking my mom probably got the same benefit. So one of the ways that I started my weight loss journey, like I said, I have not such great knees, is I started in the water with water aerobics. <laughs> and that's an excellent form of exercise because you have it's a lot of resistance training without it feeling like, you know, you're you're doing an Arnold Schwarzenegger um, you know, weight routine. Is that something that you would consider with somebody with Alzheimer's? You can certainly, I would say in the earlier stages of the disease can still do water fitness with, with this particular group. Uh, I think it needs uh, extra supervision. So I like, as was with all my uh, clients, I like to integrate uh, caregivers into the into that uh, scenario to be able to help when there is a factor of fear kicking in because they're you know certain exercises might lose balance and so on and so forth um but yes uh aqua fitness is certainly a, is a great form of exercising for uh, for a large percentage of the population especially if you're overweight if you have a very uh, osteoarthritic joint some in the osteoarthritis foundation has a certification program for their instructors that you know, is an aqua fitness certification because it it does help uh, the buoyancy of the water taking off load on the joints while I can still create resistance in the water depending on the speed of movement. I increase the resistance with higher speed movements and decrease resistance with lower speed movements. Yeah, so I, I, I do believe that's a good possibility, possibly not towards the advanced side of the disease, then it becomes much more of a, of a, a panic risky kind of thing where they completely uh, get anxious, overly anxious, and uh, that might not last. Um, as with any group of exercisers, ultimately it's important to find out what the person likes and dislikes. And that still does exist even in a demented, demented person. Uh, and it's important to understand that and 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 plan your workouts with this group accordingly, you know. And at the very least, include here and there those elements like the balloon where they're having just a little fun, which is not, you know, to say that you know pulling on a theraband or on a on a uh, use, lifting a weight overhead or something. Um, that's that's typically not perceived as fun by anyone. No. <laughs> right. right. It's something we do because we're, we're cognitively knowing why we're doing it. But um, 
So I think that's that's important to understand. That there is still um, likes and dislikes, even at, at the more advanced stages of the disease. Have you ever tried with somebody with more advanced dementias? Um, like we talked about, well, you want to lift weights so you can carry the grocery bags. Have you ever just used the grocery bags instead of weights? Yeah. Because I think that would have might, maybe worked better with my mom. Like, yeah. Can you carry these and walk over there and put them down? Yeah. Um, that would be very... I'm, yes. I'm trying I to think, think like how I would have motivated uh, her. Yeah. Um, I think that's, that's, that's certainly something we've been doing, um, using kind of everyday kind of tools that they that they were used to or are still used to and integrate those into into the workout strategies um and grocery bags you know putting a couple pounds into the grocery bag you know a five pound weight or or even a seven pound weight or something and have them hold this there's an exercise that you know i don't know whether you've done, ever done it's called the farmer's walk it's basically either with kettlebells or free weights dumbbells and the idea is to walk with good posture and carry this heavy weights. Ultimately, you want to come to about your body weight, carrying your body weight for 30 seconds or something like that. That's Ooh. the idea. And, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think those, those strategies certainly work. If there is, I think even when, when we're dealing with the population, you know, I, my non demanded elderly clients like it when I can bring in a, bring in a, um, how do you say um, the transition on how how is this exercising making you better in your day to day activities? You know, when it comes to head turns, range of motion exercises for the neck, you're still driving. You need to be able to look over your shoulder for oncoming traffic on the left backside and stuff like that. If you can make these transitions to everyday life, where the benefit you know helps with everyday life, I think uh, people a remember the exercise better. And B, they have a better connection with the exercise itself. Get a better connection with the exercise itself. That makes sense. So how do you work with caregivers? I'm thinking maybe some caregivers who are not part of the cult of Peloton like myself, who might also need to up their exercise game for themselves. How do you work with them to build an exercise routine into their life that they can also incorporate into their loved one's life. Okay. That it's, a, it's a good, yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, this is actually the reason why uh, my company back and form and uh, the functional aging Institute got together on a certification for caregivers uh, called the exercise specialist, a uh, caregiving exercise specialist. Um, the reason was simply, I was going to, a lot of homes, and I mentioned this earlier, where people were depending on 24-hour care or even part-time care and did not have the extra financial resources to pay me coming in five days a week. So that was the birth date, so to speak, of this idea of, of working with the caregivers. So I decided, okay, then I'm going to work, do meet, have five meetings with you and the caregiver. I developed the exercise program. I teach the caregiver to teach you. And then after two, three months, we have a quick review of the program and adjust the program, either progress or regress the exercises, depending on what's happened over the three months period. That was a uh, win-win situation. They didn't have to pay me for a long period of time. And yet the caregiver got enough training to be able to, for two, three months to bridge the gap. We have to understand that caregivers are already daily in that position right now, because if someone goes to physical therapy, um, whether demented or not, and had a hip replacement or anything like that, they eventually have to continue to re-up on their own at home. And who is doing most of the help in that scenario? It's the caregiver, whether it's a family member or somebody who is hired to do that. So what we've been trying to do is putting a program together that a makes the case why we need the caregivers to come into the fold. And that's simply because of our population growth. Um, we are uh, taking a look here, our population uh, between 2018 and 2060 for the 65 plus population. Uh, in 2018, we had 52 million 
U.S. citizens in that group. By 2060, we're expecting 95 million to be in that group. And what's the age, that bracket again? 60, 65 and older. It's the fastest population segment in the United States. Oh, I'll be in that and, group by then. <laughs> and pretty soon it's, and it was in that group, it's the 80 plus that is growing significantly. And that's really the group that is more commonly needing help, right? So we do need to get the caregivers into the fold because there aren't enough physical therapists. There aren't enough occupational therapists. There are not even enough personal fitness trainers specializing in this particular age group uh, to, to get this job done. So the caregiving exercise specialist is teaching caregivers to just become a little more confident and competent in aiding either a personal trainer or aiding a physical therapist in in uh, give, handing out the daily dose of fitness training, the daily dose of, of rehab work that is necessary in order to maintain quality of life for the person they are taken care of for as much as possible. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we are today. So we are trying to work with, with caregivers either one-on-one -on -one, if it's something local where we come in and, and work with, with the caregiver and the care receiver one-on-one. -on -one or we're working with caregiving agencies and we're doing weekend seminars where we meet with the caregivers and their care receivers. Or if that's not the case, then care two caregivers are working with each other, one being the care receiver, one the caregiver. And what is it, what's included? Well, first of all, an understanding, a, a simple understanding of what's happening to our bodies and to various systems as we age and how it does affect human performance and cognitive performance, physical and cognitive performance. Uh, what happens to us as we age with respect to immunity and what are the associated commonly seen diseases that we're face, facing as we're seeing 65 plus, 80 plus population, Alzheimer dementia being one of those. Um, and then going into training, how are we how are we training with this, these populations based on age-related changes, based on, on the health-related changes? What are the red flags and so on and so forth? So it might sound like it's very detailed and complex, but we've, we've, we've geared it towards this particular group. We don't expect them to be physical therapists. We don't expect them to be doctors. We don't expect them to be nurses. We do just want them to be feeling more confident and a little more competent when they're working on a daily, daily basis with this population. And then one quick last question. I know what the uh, recommended amount of exercise per day is generally 30 minutes. Is that a goal we should try with our loved ones or is a little bit less? I mean, anything is better than nothing. Correct. But what, what how, what what the uh, number of minutes should people shoot for? Well, when you when you say thirty minutes, that's kind of typically meant to be at at a at a moderate to higher intensity, it's more strenuous intensities. Actually, the recommendation for low to moderate activities is sixty minutes a day on the majority days of the week, four to five days a week. Um, I don't I don't know whether you, but I don't personally know too many people that are working out five days a week, sixty minutes a day, and yeah, that's good. I do. <laughs> I, I do too. I do too. But if you look at that, makes us it makes us still in this country outliers. We're not. That's not what happens on the average. But like you said in the very beginning, when you said this, you know, anything is better than nothing. Mm -hmm. And when, uh, especially when a when a person with dementia is not responding to the tr classical training, the chair stand ups, the pole pulling, the pushing, then take them on a walk. You know, take them on a walk as long as they're ambulatory, take them on walks. That is still better than sitting in front of a TV or, you know, any other sedentary activity that, you know, becomes so common for its population. Definitely. Yeah. Where I live, so I'm in California as well. We um, are. My husband is from Sunnyvale. Um, I grew up in Contra Costa County, but now we live an hour, hour south of Lake Tahoe. Okay. So you want to walk in my neighborhood? It's a power walk because, and... yep, bunch of hills. <laughs> yep. I don't think there's really any flat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you know, many of us have pets. It's a good excuse to get out and walk, take the dog for a walk, bring a loved it one is. along. And 
for caregivers. If you can walk with a, another caregiver friend, that's good for socialization, but you can also throw in some extra uh, cognitive benefits by having a conversation, um, naming as many things that start with a specific letter as you can, make it a game between the two of you while you're yep. keeping an eye on the loved ones. Yes. You know, there's a lot of benefits just to walking. It's, um, yeah. it's not my favorite exercise, though, so I, I, do, right. I do the other stuff. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, you're, you're right. I mean, uh, there is a whole new thing. I talked about power training. There is another trend that's out there. It's grown very popular. It's called, I refer to it as cognified exercising. It basically Im com combines a cognitive challenge with a physical challenge because I talked about uh, the neurogenesis. It seems like we're, the neurogenesis is taking an even bigger jump forward if we're combining the two instead of just physically active, being physically active. So that's certainly something that uh, needs to, is going to take a, a bigger and bigger chunk now in working with the middle-aged population, because like I said, it's more of a preventative type of form of exercise uh, to maintain brain health. And then finally, I think, I don't know whether you brought this up or whether we haven't, uh, Caregiving, being a caregiver, with, whether it's a family member or a professional caregiver, is physically very demanding. Mm -hmm. uh, caregivers, if the caregiving industry is an industry with the highest workers' compensation rates, and that's mm -hmm. for good reason. The number of injuries for caregivers is extremely high. Neck injuries, shoulder injuries, low back injuries are the three most common sites of these injuries. So in addition to our training on how to train the care receiver, we are also working with the caregiver and showing them ways of staying themselves healthy, strong enough, fit enough in order to be able to do the job every day. That's important. And is. so what is the website where people can learn more about this training? Uh, it's www.backinform.com. Backinform. Awesome. That yep. will be in the show notes so that everybody, you don't have to join the cult of Peloton like myself. And now I'm thinking I should harass them into, um, they, they have um, adaptive classes. One of their instructors is um, got an is a arm amputee and he does strength training classes with the weights. It's fascinating. But I did with the Women's Alzheimer's Movement, it was an event they had in San Francisco back in 2018. It was actually an exercise component and the instructor told us to do a jumping jack for each consonant of our name. So I would do a jumping jack for J and then God forbid, do a burpee for each vowel. And so that was an E burpee, two jumping jacks for the ends, another burpee. And yeah. that is really actually hard because you're trying to make sure that you're doing the form properly and yeah. you're doing the right move for the right letter. And I, I that you could literally yeah. feel your brain just like it was on fire because yeah. it was working yeah. really hard. <laughs> yeah. I have an exercise. Uh, one of my favorite exercises is not uh, necessarily for the cognitively impaired uh, group, but more as a preventative in the, for people in their fifties and sixties. Uh, I have them stand basically on the floor in the center of the clock. And I tell them, well, I want you to lunch with the right, with your right leg, 12 o'clock to six o'clock on the right side. The left leg is responsible for the left side of the clock. And then we start with, you know, I say one o'clock, they're lunging to one o'clock, seven o'clock, they're lunging to seven o'clock. Then I speed it up. So now we're talking reaction speed, quickly doing this. Then we're going to do me working on memory. And I say one, seven, four, ten. And then one, seven, four, ten, twelve. One, seven, four, ten, twelve, six. And we're going on and on until, you know, kind of like a Simon Sass game, uh, but you're getting physical activity because you're doing lunges. And, and then when people are thinking they're getting pretty cocky and know it all, and I just have a move on the clock facing two o'clock instead of 12 o'clock and then doing it again, because now we're talking spatial awareness and, and it really is challenging. Because we're no longer looking at 12 o'clock. So those are things, exercising and cognified, what I call cognified exercising, where both parts are challenged, cognition as well as physical abilities. Yeah, yeah. it's important. Well, I appreciate this. Having been uh, exercise adverse until 2006, so I was 40. 
So uh, that was a long time <laughs> to be exercise adverse and switching switching teams to daily exercise. Um, I really appreciate you educating the listeners on the importance. And, yep. you know, we don't want our, it's like the only thing that was wrong with my mother was Alzheimer's. And we did not want her to have a stroke with vascular dementia or get diabetes, which my dad had. Like right. the, my goal with her was to give her as much quality of life as possible. Thankfully, I didn't have to try to do exercises with her, but it might have helped. You never know. Yep. And um, I hope people check out your website, which I said is linked in the show notes, and get trained, get you know, get informed because it it really does actually make a huge difference in your life. Speaking Enough. from somebody who's been on both sides. <laughs> That's right. And I there is no time. It's never too late to start, and there is no good reason to stop moving unless. It really isn't possible anymore. But, you know, stay active. Uh, it, it pays off not just in quality of life. It also pays off financially because keeping yourself out of assisted living for, you know, two, three additional years makes a huge difference, especially for us here in California. Oh, yes. The cost, my, is, the cost is mind-blowing. My mom was in memory care for three years. It was just over a quarter of a million dollars. There you go. So you can uh, if that's not an invent incentive, I don't know what would be. <laughs> that's right. Fitness club memberships come a lot cheaper. That is very true. Well, yeah. I appreciate this and I hope I hope you guys all check it out because it really is it really is life changing. Good. Thank you so much for having me. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.